Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Intel Corporation first quarter 2018 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mood. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will fall at that time. If anyone should require operator assistance, please press star, then zero on your touchstone telephone. And as a reminder, this conference may be recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mr. Mark Henninger, Head of Investor Relations. Sir, you may begin. Thank you, Operator, and welcome everyone to Intel's first quarter 2018 earnings conference call. By now, you should have received a copy of our earnings release and the CFO earnings presentation that goes along with it. If you've not received both documents, they're available on our investor website, intc.com. The CFO earnings presentation is also available in the webcast window for those joining us online. I'm joined today by Brian Krasanich, our CEO, and Bob Swan, our Chief Financial Officer. In a moment, we'll hear brief remarks from both of them, followed by Q&A. Before we begin, let me remind everyone that today's discussion contains forward-looking statements based on the environment as we currently see it, and as such does include risks and uncertainties. Please refer to our press release for more information on the specific risk factors that could cause actual results to differ materially. A brief reminder that this quarter we have provided both GAAP and non-GAAP financial measures. Today, we will be speaking to the non-GAAP financial measures when describing our consolidated results. The CFO earnings presentation and earnings release available on intc.com include the full GAAP and non-GAAP reconciliations. With that, let me hand it over to Brian. Thanks, Mark. Coming off a record 2017, 2018 is off to an exceptionally strong start. Q1 was Intel's best first quarter ever and significantly exceeded the expectations we set in January. Our client computing group continued to execute well, producing growth within a declining PC market, and our transformation to a data-centric company accelerated, with our data-centric businesses, including McAfee, up 25% over the first quarter of last year. The strength of Intel's business underscores my confidence in our strategy. What we're seeing is an unrelenting demand for compute performance driven by the continuing growth of data and the need to process, analyze, store, and share that data. That dynamic benefits our traditional CPU business, and it reinforces the big bets we've made in memory, modems, FPGAs, and autonomous vehicles. We're competing to win in our largest collection of addressable markets ever. And importantly, we're not just competing in these markets, We're leading and shaping them, as our first quarter results demonstrate. Data center group revenue was up 24% year over year. We saw broad-based demand strength across all DCG segments in Q1, and customer preference for high-performance products, including Xeon Scalable, drove a richer ASP mix. The cloud segment grew 45%. And in the comm service provider segment, we continued to take share and grew revenue 33% as customers chose IA-based solutions to virtualize and transform their networks as the industry prepares for the 5G transition. Intel's presence at the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang was a powerful showcase of our 5G capability. Intel and KT deployed the world's largest 5G network to date, including more than 20 5G links delivering 3,800 terabytes of network capacity. We've established leadership in 5G, and when commercial networks begin deploying around 2019, we'll be there with industry-leading products from the core of the data center to the edge to mobile devices. And we also saw growth in our enterprise segments for the second consecutive quarter as macro strength continued and customers prioritized hybrid and on-premises infrastructure investments. Data center customers are also looking to FPGAs for workload acceleration. The Programmable Solution Group, again, set a record for design win volume, and those design wins are translating directly into revenue. PSG's business grew 17% in Q1 on data center and embedded strength, along with last-time buys. PSG's data center segment was up 150% over last year, and the advanced products category, our 28, 20, and 14 nanometer solutions, grew more than 40%. Microsoft also recently announced 
that they're using Intel's FPGAs to power new Bing intelligent search features using real-time AI. PSG's momentum is evidence that our 2016 acquisition of Altera is delivering value for our customers and contributing directly to Intel's growth. Our IOTG business grew 17% on record unit volume, with continuing momentum in the retail and video segments as compute increasingly moves to the edge. Consistent with our commitment to be a disciplined with our resources, we made the decision to divest Wind River and sharpen the focus of IOTG on other growth opportunities that more closely align to our strategy. The memory business set a revenue record, growing 20% in the first quarter, crossing over the billion-dollar mark in revenue. The last business that passed that mark was DCG, crossing over that mark over a decade ago. Both yields and output in our Dalian factory continue to ramp ahead of schedule. In fact, we believe the Dalian Fab expansion is one of the fastest brownfield the Wafer Starts projects in memory industry history. We also launched our first mainstream Optane SSDs for clients, known as the 800 series, driving further industry adoption of this revolutionary technology. The NSG remains on track to be profitable for the full year. Now, we continue to demonstrate momentum in autonomous driving, and I'm happy to report that the Intel Mobileye Autonomous Vehicle Test Fleet has begun to operate in Israel and will expand to other geographies in the coming months. Our fleet fully implements the Responsible Sensitive Safety System, or RSS, that we introduced last year. This unique system applies a formal, common-sense safety seal to the vehicle's decision-making, resulting in the optimal combination of provable safety and human-like driving style. We believe that the winning path to autonomous driving will be a progression from ADAS capabilities to full autonomous driving, and we're seeing significant momentum in the marketplace, including a recent high-volume design win for IQ5 with a European premium vehicle manufacturer. And finally, the client computing group extended its strong track record of execution in a challenging PC environment. Revenue was up 3% despite a declining PC TAM on strength in the commercial and enthusiast segments, leading to a strong core mix. The CCG launched its first ever i9 processors for laptops in the first quarter, again demonstrating our outright product leadership. We continue to make progress on our 10 nanometer process. We are shipping in low volume and yields are improving, though the rate of improvement is slower than we anticipated. As a result, volume production is moving from the second half of 2018 into 2019. We understand the yield issues and have defined improvements for them, but they will take time to implement and qualify. We have leadership products on the roadmap that continue to take advantage of 14 nanometer, with Whiskey Lake for client and Cascade Lake for the data center coming later this year. Moore's Law is central to our strategy and our product leadership it continues to create significant value for Intel and our customers. While it's taking longer and costing more to deliver and yield advanced process technologies, we are able to optimize our process and products within a node to deliver meaningful performance improvements. For example, 14 nanometer process optimizations and architectural improvements have resulted in performance gains of more than 70% since the first 14 nanometer products were launched. We combine these advances in manufacturing technology and architecture to produce truly leadership products. And it's that product leadership that ultimately matters most to our customers and end users. Intel and the industry stepped up to a tough challenge as we responded to the security vulnerabilities known as Spectre and Meltdown. I'm pleased with our progress and proud of how Intel and industry partners address this issue collaboratively with transparency, and with customer-first urgency. We're delivering against our security-first pledge, and we've now rolled out microcode-based mitigations for all Intel products launched over the last nine years that require protection against Spectre and Meltdown. 
We'll also begin delivering both client and data center products with the hardware-based mitigations later this year. With our data-centric transformation accelerating, we're raising our expectations for our full year results. Yet more evidence that our strategy is working. As Intel marks its 50th anniversary, we're well positioned to be the end-to-end -end platform provider for the new data world and a leader in the artificial intelligence and the autonomous revolution. With that, let me hand it over to Bob. Thanks, Brian. Q1 was truly an outstanding start to 2018. Our transformation to a data-centric company continues to build momentum. Revenue was a first quarter record at $16.1 billion, up 13% year over year. Operating income was $4.8 billion, up 21% year over year. And EPS of $0.87 cents was up 32% year over year. From a capital allocation perspective, we generated $6.3 billion of cash flow from operations and returned $3.3 billion to shareholders in the form of buybacks and dividends. As a result of the strength we are seeing in the business, we are raising our full-year revenue guide by $2.5 billion to $67.5 billion. We're raising our EPS guide by $0.30 cents to $3.85. And we're raising our free cash flow guide by $1.5 billion to $14.5 billion. Our Q1 results demonstrate a continued momentum in our transformation from a PC-centric company to a data-centric company. Intel's data-centric businesses were up 25% collectively, with each business individually growing double digits. Our data-centric businesses are now approaching 50% of our revenue, an all-time high. Our PC-centric business was up 3% on strength in notebook, desktop, and modem. DCG strong cash flows fund Intel's investments in new data-centric growth. As a reminder, we adopted a new revenue recognition standard in Q1. The new standard drove $462 million in incremental Q1 revenue recognition. This predominantly affected CCG and NSG. By year-end, we expect roughly half of this to net out. Moving to Q1 earnings, we generated significant EPS expansion in the quarter, up 32% year-on-year. Our non-GAAP EPS improvement was driven by strong top-line growth, a three-point improvement in operating margins, and an 11-point reduction in our effective tax rate. The three-point improvement in operating margins were driven by a four-point reduction in spending, partially offset by a one-point decline in gross margin. The one-point decline in gross margin was driven by growth in our adjacencies, which have lower gross margins than our CPU products. From a spending standpoint versus last year, we delivered $1.3 billion more revenue on $200 million less spending. As a second reminder, we adopted a new mark-to-market standard for our equity investments. In 2017, all realized gains and losses were recorded in our non-GAAP results. But in 2018, all mark-to-market adjustments flow through earnings. In an effort to eliminate volatility, we have excluded these adjustments from our non-GAAP results. Our Q1 GAAP EPS included approximately $0.13 cents from mark-to-market gains in our ICAP portfolio that were excluded from our non-GAAP results. We are also making excellent progress on our operating efficiencies. In January, we pulled in our 30% spending goal from 2020 to 2019, and we're off to a good start in 2018. Total spending was down 4% year over year in the quarter. R&D spending as a percentage of revenue is down approximately two points, and our SG&A costs were down over two points. 
Our intensity on spending is designed to accelerate top-line growth, and it is paying off. Currently, as a result of strong top-line growth, we now expect to meet our 30% spending target in 2018, two years ahead of our original expectations. Let me touch briefly on our Q1 performance by segment. The data center group delivered a great quarter, much better than expected. DCG revenue of $5.2 billion was up 24% year over year, and operating income of $2.6 billion grew 75%. Q1 operating margin was 50%. Overall, unit volume was up 16%, and ASPs were up 7%. We saw broad-based demand strength in Q1, with customer preference for high-performance products driving richer ASPs. Cloud and comm service provider segments were greater than 60% of the data center business. And this was the first quarter our cloud business has surpassed $2 billion in revenue, which made it our largest segment in the first quarter. Additionally, we've redefined our expanded TAM for DCG to markets beyond the CPU, like silicon photonics, fabric, network ASICs, and 3D cross-point memory. These adjacent businesses are gaining traction and grew 16% year over year. ECG performance in all segments was better than our January forecast, and we expect that strength to continue to aid DCG momentum through the second quarter. Our additional data-centric businesses, IOTG, NSG, and PSG are becoming a larger component of our overall business, growing 18% year over year in the quarter. Our Internet of Things business achieved revenue of $840 million, growing 17% year over year, driven by strength in video and continued momentum in retail. Operating profit was $227 million, up 116% year over year on higher revenue and lower spending as we shifted our ADAS investments to Mobileye. As you heard from Brian, the Mobileye business is going strong. Q1 revenue was $151 million, and while it's early in the journey, we are on track to our deal thesis. Our memory business broke the $1 billion in quarterly revenue for the first time, up 20% year over year, with strong demand for data center SSD solutions. We reduced our operating losses by $48 million with strong gigabyte demand and unit cost reductions more than offsetting ASP reductions. The transition to 64 3D NAND is improving our costs while we invest in and expand our Dalian factory. We expect the second half of 18 to be balanced between supply and demand, and we continue to expect this segment to be profitable for the full year of 2018. The Programmable Solutions Group had revenue of $498 million with 17% growth, driven by strength in data center and the embedded segments. Operating profit was $97 million, up 5% year over year. The PSG team continues to perform and execute well. Our advanced FPGA products, those at 28, 20, and 14 nanometer, grew over 40% in the quarter. In fact, PSG won more customer designs in Q1 than in any prior quarter. Finally, the client computing group had another strong quarter. Revenues of $8.2 billion were up 3%, and operating margins were down 4 points due to 10 nanometer transition cost and growth in our modem business. Our PC-centric business continues to perform well in a challenging but improving market and serves as a significant source of cash flow for the company. We saw strength in the commercial and gaming businesses, and we believe the worldwide PC supply chain is operating at healthy levels. We've laid out our capital allocation priorities, 
invest organically, expand acquisitively, and return capital to our shareholders, and do it wisely. We continue to execute to these priorities. We generated $6.3 billion in cash from operations. This included $1.7 billion in cash received from NAN customer supply agreements. We invested $2.9 billion in CapEx and delivered $3.4 billion in free cash flow, up 73% year over year. We returned almost 100% of free cash flow to our shareholders in the form of $1.9 billion in buybacks and $1.4 billion in dividends, a 10% increase per share over last year. Now, moving to our full-year outlook. Our strategy is working, and our investments are paying off. We are now forecasting the midpoint of the revenue range at $67.5 billion, up $2.5 billion versus our expectations in January. We expect operating margin of approximately 31%, up one point from January, as spending as a percent of revenue drops to approximately 30%. Versus prior estimates, gross margin will be approximately flat as broad-based strength in our business is offset by the higher costs associated with the 10 nanometer volume production shift to 2019. We now expect a full year tax rate of 13%, one point down versus our prior estimates. Overall, stronger top-line growth, improved operating margins, and a lower tax rate will boost EPS to $3.85, up $0.30 versus prior estimates. From a cash flow perspective, we are increasing our free cash flow to $14.5 billion, up $1.5 billion from January. We now expect net capital deployed of approximately $12.5 billion, up $500 million versus the expectations we set in January. This reflects gross capex of approximately $14.5 billion, offset by approximately $2 billion of customer prepayments for memory supply agreements. In Q2, we expect strong growth to continue. We are forecasting the midpoint of the revenue range at $16.3 billion, up 10% year over year. We expect operating margin of approximately 30%, up one point versus last year, which reflects approximately one and a half point decrease in gross margin and a two and a half to three point decline in spending. We expect EPS at 85 cents, up 31%, excluding equity adjustments from strong top-line growth, spending reductions, and a lower tax rate. To sum it up, we believe 2018 will be another record year for Intel. We've met and exceeded our financial commitments, and we feel great about where we are relative to our three-year plan. Our PC-centric team keeps winning in a challenging market, and our data-centric businesses are growing fast, fueling Intel's transformation to a company that powers the cloud and smart connected devices. With that, let me turn it over to Mark, and we'll get to your questions. All right. Thank you, Brian and Bob. Moving on now to the Q&A, as is our normal practice, we would ask each participant to ask one question and just one follow-up if you have one. Operator, please go ahead and introduce our first questioner. Thank you. And the first question will come from the line of Ross Seymour with Deutsche Bank. Your line is now open. Hi, guys. Thanks for letting me ask a question, and congrats on the strong results. Brian, one for you about the, the sustainability of this demand, specifically in the data center side. I think People are are pretty aware that the macroeconomic drivers are are all kind of going the right way, and that's helping the enterprise side of things. But the acceleration of the cloud and the comm side for the last two quarters has beaten your own expectations uh, for growth rates and been quite strong. How much of that do you believe is Intel-specific, and if you could go into the reasons why, or is the macro side really the bigger driver on those two vectors as well? Sure, Ross. That's a good question. Um, Let me try and answer it. 
so the first thing I tell you is that there is a bit here that is that you know the, the transition to cloud continues to occur, occurring at, at a bit even of a faster rate. So that you do see that trend going on. Uh, the, Remember, we've always talked about that over the long haul, you have to, to look at these. It can sometimes be lumpy. So our, you know, our, our forecast for the, the long term is still in that you know, um, high teens, low 20s kind of range for that kind of growth. Um, we thought that you know, we, we've, the enterprise is clearly up. We think that, as you said, that it, a lot of that is you know, um, reinvigoration of investments by companies in on-site data. Uh, our view of the uh, long term there, I look out over the long term again, it's still that should be in a declining mode versus moving those workloads long term over to the cloud. So if I, if I take a look at this, you know, as Bob said in his prepared remarks, you know, we look at if, our, if I look at our data-centric businesses in general, so even just beyond the data center, we see, see these growing in that, you know, mid to high teens uh, range. Uh, and that's kind of how we view this, and we do believe that is sustainable. And it will, you know, move from cloud to enterprise, and, you know, sometimes you'll see IoT pick up a bit and offset something, but that's why we group those into that data-centric, but they're all really tied together. It's data coming from the edge, moving through the network into the data center, uh, and really being based in the cloud and analytics being applied to it and, uh, you know, and people using that data then to make decisions or drive businesses. So, so we think it's sustainable in the, the kind of the data-centric numbers that you saw, but it will float between you know, those various uh, segments. The, the only thing, Ross, that I would add is uh, in terms of uh, our outlook uh, in the more uh, near term, our outlook for the year is, you know, kind of continued strength in the second quarter, um, you know, similar to the first quarter. Um, and, but, uh, you know, beyond that, it's probably a little cloudier. I think we are benefiting from global macroeconomic environments. I think the higher earnings is um, a higher earnings and the ability to deduct. Uh, IT-related expenditures, I think, is, you know, given CIOs a little more money to spend. And we see, we see ourselves benefiting from that through the first half of the year. You know, second half is going to be a little bit of a wait and see as to whether the, you know, the short-term dynamics uh, continue into the second half. But you go back to Brian's comments, I think the, you know, what we do know is the this increased demand for compute data, analytics, storage, rapid retrieval is what's really driving the demand for high-performance compute. And not only do you see the unit volume strength, but also the ASP strength, which we think is a function of, you know, Intel, Intel-related products. That's very helpful. I, for my follow-up question, one for either of you, frankly, on the 10 nanometer push-out, uh, do you believe that the competitive lead you have versus your competition is, is shrinking, or is this a challenge everybody's going to have? And then the gross margin side of that equation, Bob, you said it was going to be a headwind into the full-year guide. Uh, any sort of linearity about when that starts to move from being a headwind to a tailwind would be great. Thanks. Sure, Ross. Um, so let me start with, you know, we absolutely have product and process leadership. We're shipping 10 nanometer products today. So. I did want to make sure that that was very clear to you, and those are the densest, highest performing products uh, out there. We're slowing the ramp down as we go and fix the yields, and we're able to do that. A, we understand the yield issues. Um, they're really tied to this being the, the last technology tied uh, to not having EUV and the amount of multi-patterning and, and the effects of that on uh, defects. But also the, the real strength of 14 nanometers. Uh, mentioned in my prepared remarks that we've done 70% improvements in uh, the performance of that technology over its current lifetime. And we believe it continues to have legs, that we can continue to make improvements both within that process technology and architecturally. And that's really giving us the breathing room to go and make these uh, yield improvements. So it's really balancing between delivering the world's best products we believe our roadmap for 2018 is as strong or stronger than it's ever been, 
and we have the ability to carry that into 2019, allowing us to get the yields where we want them to be, so that the costs and the spending are really in line with what you as a shareholder expect from us. And, you know, we, we believe that, um, you know, if you took a look at others during this time frame, if you, if you looked at anybody else and said 70% improvement on a technology node, you know, they may rename those nodes as we go through this. And we have always chosen to be, you know, really transparent and clean and just say it's improvements on the existing technology uh, rather than renaming. So, so we, we believe we have that. Now, uh, you know, as we um, look at out in time, we do see uh, the density. You just take that component. The density uh, gap is narrowing a bit, but that's out in time. But again, performance is really a, a function of you know multiple parts of the process around power and performance, and then the architecture. And that's why we think our products continue to lead and be the the world standard. And on the um, on the gross margin question, the um, you know the strong uh, both volume and ASP performance in the first quarter contributed to gross margins being two points ahead of kind of our expectations at the beginning of the year. So we saw that real good performance on top line flowing through in the first quarter. What we indicated for the full year, though, there's no change in our full year gross margin. That essentially is a function of continued volume and ASP strength, but partially offset by uh, yields that are improving, but not quite at the rate that we had anticipated on 10 nanometer and secondly, um, the, our costs associated with, um, we, we expect it, at the end of the year that we'll have pre-PRQ reserves that will be a little bit higher as we shift, uh, we shift into 2019. So strong first quarter, uh, strong for the full year, but those 10 nanometer costs will be a little bit of a, a, little bit of a drag. When we step back, we still look at kind of gross margins for the full year that are at the high end of kind of our historical range in the, you know, 60 to 65 percent range, which is good. And for us, that's despite the fact that we're getting really solid growth from our uh, lower margin, but earnings accretive businesses like, um, like modem and memory. Thanks, Ross. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question comes from the line of Stacy Raskin with Bernstein Research. Your line is now open. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, I wanted to follow up on that 10 nanometer point. So as that, the volume production pushes out into 2019, given you understand the yield issue supposedly, um, is this a first half kind of push out or does it push out into the second half? And when it actually does ramp, do you think it actually will be the current 10 nanometer process that's shipping or will that be sh like slipping out to like 10, 10, 10 nanometers plus potentially? So um, I, I'm just going to correct you. said that supposedly we have the, the solutions. We, we do understand these. And so you know, we, we do have confidence that we can go and um, work these issues, Stacey. Um, right now, you know, as I said, we are shipping. Um, we're going to start that ramp as soon as we think the yields are in line. So, you said 2019. We didn't say first or second half. But it'll we'll do it as quickly as we can based on the yields. Um, and the, the last part of your question about whether will it be a 10 or a 10 plus plus or a 10 plus? I think it was your question. Um, you know, it, these. These, uh, the, the yield improvements that we're making are just that, more focused on, on yield. So think of them as uh, improvements to the various etch steps and lithography steps and cleans and things like that in order to really drive the, the multi-patterning and in some cases the multi-multi-patterning where we have four or five, six layers of patterning to, to produce a feature. It's really about that. They aren't necessarily around performance. We do have plans on 10 nanometer already, similar to 14 nanometer, for 10 plus and 10 plus plus. And so we think all of these technologies now have you know, multiple years of uh, uh, performance improvement built into them uh, as they come off the floor. Thank you. Um, for my follow-up, I wanted to ask about gross margin drivers and free cash flow drivers into 2019. We, we have CapEx pretty significantly outpacing depreciation at the moment. You'll have that 10 nanometer ramp kind of starting. Memory and, and modems are probably going to be growing. Um, and then on the free cash flow side, we've got the reversal 
potentially of the NAND prepayments, eventually you have to start shipping the NAND that you've been paid for. So how do we, how do we think about the driver's um, gross margin puts and takes um, around those elements and maybe others um, as we get into, as we go through, uh, get into 2019? Yeah, um, you know, first um, I'm going to um, probably not dwell a whole lot on 2019 as we focus on trying to execute what we believe will be an outstanding 2018. But I think there's a few a few dynamics that we've been we've been wrestling with. Um, as you know, over the last couple of years, we've seen um, a a gap between earnings and cash flow. And it's really been driven by a couple things. You know, one, uh, success. And by that I mean, you know, accelerating rates of growth and the additional capital that goes along with that growth, both CapEx and, and inventory levels. So those have been one of the, one of the drivers. Secondly, you know, we, we've brought on um, a nanometer equipment but haven't necessarily put it to use yet. So that's a cash driver without an impact on earnings. And, and third, um, you know, mem- memory is in, this, in the investment phase. Um, so those three things have really been what's, what's been driving the gap. And we've done, we've done a few things uh, in light of that that you're aware of. Um, one, um, you know, memory, we, we engaged in the strategic supply agreements that you mentioned, which really for us is a sign that um, our customers – are excited and committed to the technologies that we're building such that we can help, we can use uh, their money to help fund the scaling of the business. And we think that's a good, positive, short, medium, and long-term move. And the other thing, just if you, if you think about, Stacy, you know, kind of how we guided uh, this year, you have earnings, um, if you, if you, don't give us credit for the you know the ICAP gains last year and strip that out. You see earnings growth, that's you know roughly 25, 26 percent, and you see free cash flow growth that's in the in the mid 30s. So you'll start to see that gap narrowing as we go through the course of this year. And then the other thing is we're going to make a fairly significant cash tax payment in 2018 as a result of the ICAP gains from last year. And that's roughly a billion two that's going to weigh on our cash flows this year. If you strip that out for a second, what you see during the course of 2018 is roughly 25% earnings growth and roughly 50% uh, free cash flow growth. And that gap begins to narrow while we're accelerating the growth rate of the business. So those are... That's kind of the dynamics in terms of how we're deploying capital for accelerating top-line growth and the improvements on free cash flow relative to earnings per share this year. As we get through the course of um, um, 2018, we'll start to shed a little more light on what that means for 2019 later in the year. Thanks for the question, Stacey. Thank you, guys. Thank you. The next question comes from the line of Chris. Stanley with Citigroup. Your line is now open. Hey, thanks, guys. Um, I guess another question on the manufacturing. Uh, c- can you just talk about why the the ramp in 10 nanometer, why the yields have been, you know, a little bit slower than expected? Uh, has, have there been any changes in manufacturing? And then also, should we expect this to extend to uh, future generations as well, i.e., a little bit slower than than it have been in the past? Um, sure. So uh, the the issues around 10 nanometers, I, I've kind of tried to lay that, that out without getting too deep into the technology, but this is the last technology with, um, that doesn't incorporate EUV. And what you also need to understand is that um, we took very aggressive goals at 10 nanometers. So if you, if you talk about the scaling factor or think about it as the multiple at which you shrink a feature, okay, um, we took a target of 2.7. So, you know, you took any feature and 1 over 2.7 is the, the dimensional shrink that you did to this uh, device. Um, for example, on 14 nanometers, we took a target of 2.4. So, you know, you're, you're almost 10% uh, uh, more aggressive on 10 nanometers. 
And if you look at what more is the industry standard, what the boundaries and other players are typically doing, they're typically in that 1.5 to 2.0 range. So, you know, there we're maybe 20% more aggressive. So we took very aggressive goals to hit our cost targets of where we wanted the technology to be. Um, and that combined with the end of life of the, the uh, immersion scanner before we hit EUV, I just created something that's a little bit more difficult. Um, and so that's why I have the confidence that you know, this is not something we're shipping. The transistors work. We know um, the performance is in line. So it's, it's really just about getting the, the defects and the costs in line to where we want. Um, as far as what does that imply for future technologies, We've made a lot of changes at 7 nanometers. Um, 7 nanometers currently is the first technology forecasted to implement EUV. So that immediately makes the lithography system uh, different. Uh, we're going back to a more standard for us uh, 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 compaction number of 2.4. Uh, so that makes it a little bit easy. We think we bit off a little too much in this case. Uh, and it may not seem like a lot, but 10% can make a lot of difference in, in this kind of a world. And thirdly, we are using some very unique packaging technologies and such that allow us that 7 nanometers and beyond, we really move into a world where um, you're not going to look at any piece of silicon as being a single node. Um, you're going to use what we're going to call heterogeneous techniques that allow us to use silicon from multiple nodes, so you may use cores from 7 nanometers and IP from, from 14 nanometers and, and even as far back as 22 nanometers for parts that don't need the high performance. And we're able to put those together and make them uh, perform and behave like a single piece of silicon in the package. So it really, 7 nanometers is quite a bit different, and, and, and so I think uh, as a result, we don't expect to see these kinds of impacts on 7 nanometers. Great. Um, for my follow-up, I know in the presentation you mentioned that adjacency ramps will be responsible for some of the gross margins being down in Q2. Does that have any impact on uh, gross margin for the rest of the year, or are you assuming that uh, data center growth is going to slow down in the second half of the year, and that's another reason why um, the gross margin hasn't moved up, or is it entirely the 10 nanometer issue? No, it's... Um, um we uh, maybe all all three. Um, first, um, we do expect the adjacencies throughout the course of the year to continue to grow faster than than the rest of the business, if you will. So that will have a that will have a compression kind of effect throughout the course of the year. Um, you know, secondly, yes, 10 nanometer will will um, um, be a headwind, and third, um, for data center growth. Um, while we're kind of expecting strong growth through the first half of the year, you know, the second half of the year implied in our guidance is a, is a deceleration. And if you put it in the context of kind of the, the, the updated guide, we have data-centric growth going from mid-teens to higher teens, and you can attribute virtually all of that to, to DCG because obviously it's the biggest component. Um, but we do expect there to be deceleration for DCG growth from first half to second half, um, um, for sure. We, we hope we're wrong, but at where we sit right now, we see the trends continuing in Q2. But we'll have tougher comps. We'll have tougher competition uh, going into the second half. And we're going to wait to July to see kind of how we see the trends we've experienced through the first four months of the year play out for the second half. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. And the next question comes from the line of Chris Casso with Raymond James. Your line is now open. Yes, thanks for letting me ask a question. Just the first question is on uh, CapEx um, that, that, that's been coming up a bit. If you could talk a bit, little bit about uh, the incremental growth in CapEx, what that's associated with, and are there any CapEx effects associated with uh, the changes in the ramp of, of 10 nanometer. Yeah, the um, yeah, just the uh, the capex that we took up uh, half a billion is really a function of the incremental two and a half billion dollars of revenue. So, Chris, when we came into the year, we 
we got it of logic capex of roughly ten and a half billion and we had full year revenue at sixty five billion. So we're taking sixty five up to sixty seven fifty. Um we're, that's gonna require um roughly half a billion dollars additional capex for the second half of the year and as we go into two thousand nineteen. So um it's the it's the best I've ever felt about a capex increase. Um, and it's a result of two and a half billion dollars more revenue and net the capex increase um, as we indicated will will generate an additional billion five of free cash flow as well. All right, great, thank you. And as a follow up, um, perhaps you could give a, a bit more color on the expectations on uh, on memory a, a, as you go through the year. Uh, I know you talked about that. Uh, you know, being profitable, and I think consistent with what you said, with, with what you guys said last quarter. Have there been any changes in your outlook for the year? And if you could talk a little bit about, you know, what, what what's framed your expectations as you look through the year for memory. Um, f- first, uh, no no real changes. Um, as Brian mentioned, um, you know, it's our first billion dollar order in Q1. Um, we feel good about. Uh, the demand that we're seeing, you know, demand, gigabyte demand is relatively strong. Um, our uh, cost per gigabyte coming out of our, our Dalian fab continues to trend down. Um, and at the same time, we see, you know, ASPs were down a bit. But as we go through the rest of the year, we see, you know, demand and supply to be relatively, relatively well balanced. Um, we are ramping uh, Mod A in Dalian, so that is, uh, you know, in the early stages of the ramp, that's costing a little bit. But continued gigabyte demand, continuing to scale the Dalian fab and continuing to come down the gigabyte, uh, the cost per gigabyte curve are all contributing to what we believe will be a, um, a, a continued growth and profitability for the business for the full year. And maybe the only thing I'd add to that is um, Bob mentioned it in his remarks. Our 64-tier product, we also believe, gives us, um, you know, really a leading-edge product and also uh, uh, very good costs relative to the market. Um, So as we ramp that technology in Dalian um, at 64 tiers, we uh, we believe our costs are um, very competitive relative to the rest of the market. Great. Thank you. Thank you. The next question comes from the line of John Setzer with Credit Suisse. Your line is now open. Yeah, good afternoon, guys. Thanks for letting me ask the questions. Congratulations on the strong results. Brian, I think within DCG, the cloud hyperscale dynamics are kind of well understood by investors. Ninety days ago, I think what surprised everybody, probably including yourselves, was just the strength of enterprise in the December quarter, and I think when you reported December, you were reluctant to call that a trend, and you wanted to get some more data points. I'm, I'm kind of curious as to kind of what the view of enterprise is now, 90 days later, and, and specifically a couple of your key software partners last year in Microsoft and VMware finally brought out kind of their hybrid cloud software stack solution, and I'm wondering if that's actually been the driver of some of this pent-up demand in the enterprise, and how sustainable do you think it is? Yeah, it's a great question, John. Um, you know, I, what I would tell you is clearly, as we look out into Q2, we're expecting the same kind of positive trend uh, on enterprise for um, the, the second quarter. You know, um, I think as we look at the long term, though, that that trend that says enterprise should decline in that low single digits, and it drives and helps fuel the growth of cloud. Now, it's not all the driver of the growth of cloud. Um, that, that uh, um, you know, it, it, those workloads are moving over to the cloud base continues. I think you're right. Products like Microsoft Azure and others where you can be a hybrid, Azure on-prem uh, versus Azure in cloud, are great examples how, um, you know, I think that low single digits is sustainable. Uh, over the long haul, but I just don't see that trend. Again, uh, you know, I, I try and look at these businesses not over the quarter or even one to two quarters, but really thinking about how am I going to invest over the next two to five years, i got to look at that and say that trend's probably likely to continue. 
Now, for us, you also need to understand that um, those other segments, the data center, the, the, the cloud, and like networking and comms, as I look at the data center group, are now well over 50% of the revenue uh, of that segment. So we're less and less uh, impacted, I'll say, by the enterprise. You know, if you go back when, when I started as CEO, um, you know, enterprise was 60, 70% of the business. And so we swung wildly by that. Um, it's kind of the other way around now, where the cloud and uh, networking and storage are now that 60 to 70 percent uh, growing to there, right? And and you know the enterprise is is less and less. So the other thing you need to realize, John, is it's um, it's you know we're we're more driven by what that cloud's doing anyway. That's yeah. helpful. And as my follow-up to Bob, just kind of a multi-part question on the guide for Q2 in the full year. First, was the 606 impact embedded in the original March quarter guidance? Is that the only quarter where you'll have a 606 impact? Second, is Wind River now out of the Q2 and full year guide, or is that still in it, and kind of how big is that business? And then third, when you look at Q2 specifically, it just looks like the operating income beat seems a lot larger than the EPS beat. Is there anything going on below the line other than the tax rates that you got it to that, that can explain that. Thank you. Um, yes, um, um, great question. Um, first on 606, um, what we expect for the full year, you know, we had a you know, strong benefit in the first quarter, and roughly half of that unwinds during the course of the year. So it contributed to growth in Q1. Um, it will um, It will unwind itself throughout the course of the year. So full year impact will be likely, at this stage of the game, we guess more around 200, 250 million, but it unwinds through the next several quarters. Uh, I think your second question, John, was um, Wind River. Our, our assumptions are that we will complete uh, the sale of that business at the end of the second quarter. Um, so it's in our second quarter guide, but it's a component of the first half to second half deceleration. Um, the third question, I, th I think it relates to um, in the first quarter, we had good volume uh, operating margin flow through to EPS. In the second quarter, the flow through is not as rich. And the, the, the fundamental reason is we have some you know, below the line charges associated with a, the 2039 convertible securities that we have outstanding that have a um, exchange feature associated with them. And as people, as we hit a certain stock price, our holders can exercise that exchange feature. The implications are there's a non-cash charge associated with that, which goes through our interest and other line that's negative. Um, the good aspects of it is, uh, you know, all else equal, it reduces our outstanding our diluted shares, and we avoid a coupon going forward. But that will have, um, as more as more people exercise that exchange feature, we'll see that non-cash charge below the line. So that's that's causing a little bit of a drag on uh, the operating income growth flowing through the EPS in Q2. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, John. And operator, I think we have time for two more questioners. Thank you. And our next question will come from the line of Timothy Arcuri. You're from UBS. Your line is now open. Thank you. Um, I actually had a two-part question on 10 um, Nano. Uh, you know, the issue seemed to be uh, going on now for some time, and it's almost as if the design libraries or something are, are you know, flawed. So, so I guess the first question is, why, why not skip 10 nanometer and go directly to 7? Um, you know, you guys have a lot of EUV experience, and it's going to cut out a lot of the multi-pattern layers. So, so, so that's the first question. And then number two, the um, you know, real question is that if you did that, would that be a net drag to gross margin looking out because you never really monetize 10 nanometer? Thanks. Um, uh, okay, so let me try and answer your question. So, no, there's nothing wrong with the design libraries or anything like that. I mean, the, the proof of that is that we're shipping product. So, um, you know, if there were basic functionality issues like that, you, you wouldn't be able to produce and ship a product. Um, 
you know, this again, as I said, this is all around how many uh, layers are uh, on multi-patterning and kind of the end of life of, of the uh, immersion for the critical layers. Um, the second part of your question was, would it benefit to just skip the seven nanometers, um, and would that have an effect on on the capital or the, gro the gross margins? Um, the, the simple answer is no. I don't think that's a good idea. The best answer is to fix. There's a lot of learning that will happen in this uh, that we can carry forward into seven nanometers, just like we carried from 14 to 10. Um, the other thing is that we still hold, a, you know, roughly 80 percent of our uh, capital equipment is fungible to the next node or backwards to the prior node. And so that's why, as we've shifted 10 and 14, we're able to, you know, do that without shifting our capital expenditures greatly. Um, we're able to just move the capacity back and forth. The same thing is going to happen between 10 and 7. So you'll, you'll have some percentage, and it's always based on, you know, demand and how fast things are ramping and all of that. Um, but the, the, the equipment will be fungible for the most part between um, 10 and 7 as well. But no, the, the right thing to do is um, exactly what we're doing. This is, this is a, a unique opportunity we have. There's a lot, lot more performance in 14. We can keep driving that. We'll fix the yield issues because 10 is going to have a 10, a 10 plus, a 10 plus plus. And you're going to see a lot of products and a lot of performance out of that technology. Got it, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question comes from the line of Ramesha with Numira Instanet. Your line is now open. Yes, thank you, and uh, congratulations. Uh, Brian, I wanted to ask you about China. Um, your filings indicate that mainland China was about 20-plus uh, percent of revenue in 2017. Um, and I had two questions. One, does that figure represent your your exposure to the domestic vendors in China? And you know, I guess just in light of the current environment uh, between the U.S. and China, uh, you know, there's reports now of a potential ban beyond ZTE. You know, how, how concerned how concerned are you as it relates to the impact to Intel? So yeah, that that number is is much broader. So that would be you know, if, if you think about it, um, you know everything from shipments into companies like uh, ZTE or Huawei that are more domestically oriented, although Huawei ships around the world now, uh, goes to Lenovo and companies like that, Spreadtrum, all of those companies now, if you look at Chinese companies, very few are, uh, you know, holding within just China. They're almost all shipping product and, and selling across the world. So um, that's, that the number is really representative of, of all of the companies that are, are building within China. You know, our view is that um, China is an important market, as you just described, right, 20-something plus percent. It's one of our fastest growing segments as well. Um, it's important to us, and we're counting on uh, our leaders and the, and the leaders of the world to go resolve these issues. We believe in fair trade. We believe that, you know, um, uh, Countries and companies need to be able to uh, play in markets fairly and compete, um, and we're counting on this getting worked out. Um, that's very important to us. Okay, great. Um, thanks for that. And then, Bob, I'm sure you'll you'll shed more light on um, you know longer term spending targets. But you know, as we build our models for 19, do you, do you think it's reasonable to uh, to assume that you can you can drive uh, additional operating leverage uh, beyond 2018? <laughs> You're right. I will shed more light on that later. Um, no, but I, I think look, the trends that you've seen over the last um, the last couple of years is and it's kind of how we frame things back at our at our analyst day um, uh, early last year, I guess. And that is that we're going to see, you know, an expanded TAM, and with that expanded TAM, accelerating growth in areas that have lower, lower gross margins, and that we expect over time that there will be a modest degradation in gross margins as a result of growing earnings in different segments. But at the same time, we've said that that prior, uh, you know, that gross margin, modest erosion, we believe will 
be offset by continued, um, both continuing to invest in the critical priorities, but getting leverage on our existing spending base. So with that, I think you're going to have a natural offset. Um, and, I, you know, we're two years ahead of our targets to get to 30%. You know, we're, we're excited about the accelerating growth of the company, and we do believe that as we continue to accelerate growth, and invest in key priorities that our leverage on spending can continue to come down. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Ramit. And thank you all for joining us. Operator, please go ahead and wrap up the call. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This does conclude today's conference. You may all disconnect. Everyone have a great day. <laughs>